Okay. Uh, basically, the map is dealt with the owner of Yahoo. Is it good? Framework. The file system is where you do storage, MapReduce is where you compute. Um, it's written in Java, it's open source under the Apache software license. It runs on Linux, Solaris, Mac. Uh, I believe it still runs on Sigwin, I don't know, but there have been rumors, I don't know. Um, it does? Okay, cool. Um, next slide, please. Um, HDFS, most of you know this, is designed to store large files with large block sizes of 64 to 128 megabytes. In fact, at Yahoo, we're probably going to you know, 5 megabytes soon. Each block is stored on multiple servers for redundancy. We call it replicas. Data is um, replicated on me. If one of the nodes, data nodes goes down, we'll replicate them again. Um, in terms of the user interface, you have multiple choices. You can either do shelling commands. You can embed them in you know, your bash scripts or whatever. Or you can use the Java API or the C API. Right. Next slide. Uh, again, MapReduce is a programming model for efficient battle programming. Its efficiency stems with the fact that you do um, streaming reads and not and not seeks. So you you do streaming reads on the data. You don't seek to particular records. Um, and also the pipeline. I'll talk a little bit about it. It's a good fit for a lot of application, uh, log processing, web index building. In fact, a lot of our team actually came from YST, which is Yahoo search technology, and that's where a lot of it was used initially. All right, so now the more, more interesting parts of the talk. Um, here, increasingly, a lot of people, a lot of enterprises especially, are, are using Hadoop. Um, we have Yahoo, Twitter, Facebook, eBay, lots of people, right? Um, so the usage model increasingly is looking like you know, very large shared multi-tenant clusters, where multiple organizations come in, you have a large cluster of four or five thousand machines and shared by everybody. You don't want to have a model where you know, everybody has ten nodes. Right? This way it's way more efficient. You're not wasting money, you don't have fragmentation on your clusters. Um, millions of dollars are, are getting processed by you know, Yahoo and Facebook and so on. Uh, particular examples of Yahoo are advertising and search. Um, we have 40,000 machines running Hadoop and you know, going up every month, in fact. Uh, the large, single largest of the, the 40,000 machines, but the single, uh, the, the size of the largest cluster we have is close to 4,000. Um, it's a lot. Uh, if you guys are more interested in who else is using Hadoop, there's a link there. Uh, you can go to the wiki, um, Hadoop wiki, and find some more. Okay. However, um, this is where you know uh, everybody needs to take a pinch of salt. Uh, Hadoop isn't a silver bullet. Um, what it means is you can't take your application that you were running yesterday. Uh, boot up Hadoop and then just expect it to go fast, right? The problem comes from the fact that you need to be aware of the MapReduce paradigm and how it interacts with your application. And that's what most of this talk is going to cover. So things like Pig and Hive can help. Um, the Pig and the Hive frameworks are frameworks on top of MapReduce. You, the developers there have you know, spent um, mad years of effort doing stuff that an, an individual developer doesn't have time to work on. Right, if you want to do joins, if you want to do replicator joins, all this stuff is, is available in Pig and Hive. So it really encourages you guys to use it. Um, like I said, you need to adapt your legacy applications to Hadoop. And that's where you know, a lot of users run into trouble. They, they, they continue to do what they're doing with, without Hadoop. 
and they surprise when they see the results. I mean, of course, we're, it's also a drawback of the framework. The framework has to get better to make sure it adapts to its users better. But at this point, it's not there, right? Um, so given the amount of money people are investing in Hadoop, efficient usage of Hadoop um, needs cooperation from its users. And that, that's what most of this talk is going to cover today, right? Uh, just a quick overview, right? Um, how many of you are aware of what Mapper uses, the different mappers and their users and so on? Will it make sure? I think so. Okay. <laughs> um, so it sort of works like a, a Unix pipeline, right? So you, if you look at import, grep, sort, unique, cat, you can you can directly sort of map and use map map and use to it. So you have the input phase, the map phase, the shuffle and the sort phase, the reduce phase, and the output phase. So think of the Unix pipeline. Um, map use works in key value pairs. So you have input keys and input values, intermediate keys and values, output keys and values, right? And the data flow looks like that. Unfortunately, it doesn't look very clear here. Hmm. So you have the input that's split up. You have multiple maps crossing that in parallel. And then the output of the maps get shuffled over to the reduce. We call it the shuffle phase. And then it the reduces um, right the outputs. OK. All right. So I'm going to go through the pipeline and you know, do a quick overview of sort of the best practices. And then also the anti patterns we've seen. Um, like I said, at Yahoo, we have 40,000 clusters and we have a lot of users. And you do, when you have that many, that many nodes and that many users, you'll see a lot of interesting things. Okay, so input. You've got to remember that Hadoop, uh, from its roots, um, has been optimized to process very large data sets. So from, historically, we've, we've gone for throughput versus latency. Right? We, we try to optimize the framework to get throughput for your um, application, not latency. And that's changing. In, uh, definitely at Yahoo, you have more and more use cases where latency is important. But at this point, if you have to pick one, Hadoop is better throughput. Um, what is the pattern here? So in this talk, I'd like to introduce the notion of a, pack, a, a grid pattern. Right? This is sort of similar to what you, uh, a design pattern. And you want to see the, and these are the things you want to watch out for in your applications. Right? As you write these applications, you want to see if you can follow most of these patterns, or at least some of these patterns, and definitely not the anti-patterns. So what you'd like to do is, in terms of its input, input to a job, you want to, you want to process a lot of data per map, right? Because there's a cost of spawning a map and processing that data and sorting it and shuffling it and so on. So what you want to do is you want to amortize the cost away. You want to amortize the cost by having fewer maps, right? Which means if you have a lot of input files, a lot of small input files, the framework at this point doesn't do a good job of you know, collecting them together to run them. And you have some libraries to do it. You know, I don't know how many of you guys have heard of the multi-input format and so on. You want to be using the multi-input formats, right? Because you don't want to be spawning too many maps. Um, also, even if you have a large amount of data to process, uh, the default block size, which is 64 megabytes, is not really the most efficient, right? If you're processing, you know, a terabyte of data, if you chunk it into 64 meg megabytes blocks, blocks of 64 MB, that's a lot of blocks. What you'd rather do is have fewer number of larger maps. You know, choose a larger block size, 512 5 megabytes or 256 megabytes, and so on, right? Um, mappers. Again, we talked about this. If you have small files, process more files per, per map. Use the modified input format. In future, um, we're working on making sure the framework will do it automatically for you. Right? The framework should be able to see that you have very little amount of data per file and choose more of them for a single map. Um, like I said, a, an extreme example in terms of large scale data processing is, was the petasort benchmark we ran last year. So this was about sorting a, a petabyte of data. Now that's a lot of data. There, we, again, we didn't use the default block size of uh, 128 megabytes, right, or 64 megabytes. We actually processed uh, 12 gigabytes per map, again, to amortize the cost. 12 gigabytes is a lot per map, but we actually did that. It actually worked out pretty well, right? So again, part of the problem is that Hadoop is a very general framework. It, we let the users run their own code in the map and the reviews. 
So it's really hard for us to predict what the cost of a single, the, the cost of processing a single record is going to be, which is why really helpful to users. So unless your applications are very CPU intensive, I mean, if you want to take one record and do a lot of processing, if you're doing an MPI kind of thing, it's really hard. So what you want to do is, unless your pro, um, per record processing is very expensive, you want to do lots of data per map. Right? That's a pattern. sorts of data. That's a contract that uh, the framework provides to its users, right? You take the output of the maps, you aggregate them, and then send it to the reduce. Now, what can you do better here? What can, as a user, what can you do better? Um, use combiners, right? A combiner provides cheap map side aggregation. When you do aggregation on the map, what, what the result is that the amount of data you transfer on the network from the map to the reduce reduces a lot. So use a combiner, right? But again, um, part of the problem is using a combiner is expensive if you're not doing, if you're actually not gaining much out of the combiner. If your combiner is not able to aggregate, it doesn't make sense to use the combiner. So be, be careful. You have counters in the framework to track the input and the output of the combiners. So you can use that to track whether your combiners are being efficient or not. Right? Um, shuffle. Again, um, when, you process, when you're moving data between the map and the reduce, what you want to do is compress the output so that the cost of the network transfer is, is lesser, right? But again, it's really hard for a general framework to do it because a lot of times you might be shuffling binary data. And in a lot of compression codecs, if you compress binary data, the output of the compression is actually going to be greater than the input. So you've got to be careful there, right? But if you're using text, of course, it makes sense. You know, if you're using text, choosing an appropriate combiner makes sense. Um, so the pattern is use combiners judiciously, um, make sure they work, and compress intermediate outputs. Right? Reducers. Um, we talked about how the map output of, the output of every map goes to every reduce. So what, what you have in the map use framework is a crossbar. So if you, if you can go back to one of my the, the picture. Yeah. So if you see that, that's actually an M cross N network transfer. So that's what we call as the crossbar. Now, the larger the number of maps and the larger the number of reducers, the, the crossbar is going to be more expensive, right? So choosing the appropriate amount of maps and reducers is very important for your shuffle performance because the crossbar is very expensive. So you, you got to be careful about that. Uh, yeah. So if you have too few reducers, what will happen is you know, you'll get a, a terabyte of data down to one node, and that node is going to process a terabyte very, very slowly. Sometimes it even dies because a terabyte is a lot to process. It might not have the CPU or the RAM or whatever. And then you'll, because of the fault tolerance of the framework, you'll launch another reduce who's going to process another terabyte of data and die slowly. Right? So you've got to be careful about having, if you, you don't want to, um, you don't want to, too few reducers. Similarly, you don't want too many reducers. If you have too many reducers, the crossbar becomes very expensive. So the crossbar is actually dominated by the seek. So if you have more seeks, which is n cross n, your, your performance suffers as a result. Um, a, a good way to look at this is to say that you know, in your reduce, in each of your reducers, you want to process at least a gigabyte of, or two of, of data. If you're, if you're processing less than you know, a gigabyte or two of data, you could actually tune your application better. The other flip side is you don't want to process you know, more than 10, 20 uh, gigs of data, unless you really know what you're doing. Right? Next one, please. Output. Um, so the output of your job is linear, linear with respect to the number of reduces. Again, every output, every reduce is going to produce one output file, at the very least. Right? You could, you could, pro you could uh, produce more than one. But you got to be careful about the number of reducers to make sure you don't uh, produce too much or too less. Compress the outputs of your reducers. Again, use an appropriate compression codec. We have um, GZIP and LZO and BZIP and so on. And 
It really depends what your application is doing. If you're processing a lot of data, if you're producing a lot of output, it might, sense to, it might make sense to use BZIP, because BZIP is going to give you a lot more compression. So you save on the network cost. Um, think of the consumer. This is actually critical. The output that you pr produce for every MapReduce job is usually going to be processed by, some, by the next job. Right? So if you produce too much or if you produce too many files, too many small files, the subsequent jobs which process the data, this data, um, they are going to be slow. And this thing is multi file input format over there. So be careful. Um, also, if you're producing very large outputs, if you're producing you know, a ter 100 terabyte output set, strongly, uh, we strongly urge you to use you know, a larger block size. Use a 5 megabyte block size. Again, this comes about. This is about thinking about your consumer. So if your consumer is going to be using a larger block size, is, is producing, is processing a lot of data, he's better off using a larger block size. So think of the consumer always. So a pattern is you know, application outputs to be few, with each file spanning multiple HDFS blocks, if necessary, and appropriately comp compressed. So don't use a 64 MB block size for your outputs if you're producing a lot of output. Right? Um, distributed cache. How many of you have used the distributed cache? Not a lot. Okay, so distributed cache was designed to efficiently you know, send out a small number of